Well, we're, we've come 17 weeks. We've come to the end of 1 Corinthians. Did you think it's going to take forever? I mean, some of you did. I, and others of you I've, I've watched. I mean, I, I, there's not very many of us. because I, So I can watch people. and say, hey, you've been tracking. You've been like reading the Bible during worship, you know, which tracking with us, and that's, that's, that's really a good thing. I think it's been a good series, not because I'm preaching it, but just because the letter is so good and the word is so powerful. But I just want to review, just want to go through, spend the first five minutes or so, just kind of reviewing 1 Corinthians. And so, first, you know, the first week we learned that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are declared holy, uh, just like the Corinthians are, not because we've been so good, but because we're in partnership with Jesus and, and he just declares us to be holy. And then we, we went on and Paul, um, in that second week, talked about the foolishness of the cross. And he said he preaches Christ crucified. He doesn't preach something that people always want to hear all the time, but he preaches what's the core of our faith. He said, uh, he said this divides humanity. You know, some people, you know, it's, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved by it, it's the power of God. Jesus Christ crucified. And then chapter 2, he, he says that he didn't come to them with slick words. I mean, these are Greeks. They're, they're very eloquent speakers. And he said, I didn't come like that. He said, as a matter of fact, I got out of the way so the Spirit could move. So I came to you kind of in foolishness. You know, I put aside all these other trappings where I could appear to really be somebody. And I came to you as, as little and, and less of me. So that was kind of like less of me and more of God. Then in chapter 3, we focused on how Paul spoke to them as a group. Now, that's when we put up the banner up here that said, we are a temple. Those aren't up there permanently, you know. So if you haven't been here beyond 1 Corinthians, we do change those out. But that was the week that we put up that we are a temple because he was speaking to the church and going, you. And most of the time we hear those you words and we think singular. And he wasn't speaking singular, it's plural. And he was talking about the temple of God being a congregation. In chapter 4, um, Paul looked into their lives and, and some of the arrogance of some of the people. And they were fighting in their church and they had divisions. And one of them liked one guy and somebody else liked another guy. And they were just, he said, you're just arrogant. But at the end of it, what we really focused on was Paul said, live your life like me. Imitate me. And so what we did there, if you remember, is we talked about how we need to have lives that are worth imitating. Because somebody is looking at us and imitating us. And in the same way, we need to have someone else that we look at and we say, I want you to teach me. I want you to mentor me. I want you to bring me up in the faith. Then the situation in Corinth came up, which, it, you know, we kind of went on the downside for a while. And there was this man in Corinth that uh, was sleeping with his stepmother. And, you know, we all kind of went oh, like that for that. And, and the thing was, is the Corinthians church, they were bragging about it. They said, this is really cool. We can do this. This is okay. And Paul got pretty tough with them about that. And he said, there are boundaries to life. Just because you're in Christ and you're forgiven doesn't mean that you can just do anything that you want. There are boundaries to life. And then in chapter 6, he went a little deeper into that. He, he addressed the whole immorality among people. And um, he said, flee sexual immorality. And we learned that, that sexual immorality, what, that what that, that phrase means is it's all sex outside of marriage. And we learned that, that sex has a spiritual dimension to it. It's not just a physical thing. And then we talked about the status quo, that it's all about the gospel, and Paul tells them, hey, you know, kind of bloom where you're planted kind of thing. Don't go changing your life around a whole bunch just so you can, you know, look more Christian. But, you know, it's, that's not important. What's important is, is uh, it's all about the gospel. Don't get in the way of the gospel. Then in chapter 8, we talked about the shades of gray. Uh, he was talking about that in their day, there were some people that were eating all this meat that was been sacrificed to these pagan idols, and some of the younger Christians that had just come out of that kind of idol worship, this was stumbling them. And so Paul teaches us that on areas like this, that we don't do something that stumbles another believer, that we've got a responsibility to the community. So uh, you need to watch that. And then it was flexibly rigid. Um, 
he, he talked about that we need to do anything that we can do to reach people for God. He, remember he said, I, can, I, I have become all things to all people so that I might win, win some to Christ. And so it doesn't matter what pe- people look like on the outside or their particular lifestyle, but, but you know, he, it's all about the gospel. It's all about reaching them. Chapter 10 was about testing, and we, we realize that, that God tests us there. He will not test us beyond what we can endure, but God does send testing our way so he can prove our faith and so that we might grow. And then we got into the stuff about the Lord's Supper, and they had some really bad table manners, and they were kind of making a sham of the whole thing. And in that, um, he's, we learned that, that God doesn't expect us to be worthy on our own to come to the table, that nobody can come to the table because we're sinless, but he declares us worthy because of what Jesus Christ has done. I, I think that was a kind of a pivotal moment. We worked in that for a couple of weeks here in the gathering. I thought that was a great learning that God showed us that, that week. And then chapter 12, the spiritual gifts, and each person has a gift. There's no such thing as an insignificant gift. And then chapter 13 was about love, the love chapter, you know. And we learned there that the community prevents jealousy, that sometimes we, we get kind of jealous of another person. But if we really found out what was going on in their lives, we wouldn't be jealous because everybody's got some down things. Everybody's got some problems. And then in, in chapter 14, he teaches us on restoring the order and worship. It was all about tongues and, and prophecy. And we learned there that um, God speaks to us through our mind and in the spirit, and both are important. Then last week, it was on resurrection and how faith and hope stand on the resurrection, and that is the foundation for so much. So now we come to the end. And this last chapter, I don't know if you read it this week or not, but chapter 16, 24 verses, and Paul gives them some kind of housekeeping kind of things. He talks about how uh, he, he's going to take a trip and he's going to send Timothy to them maybe and some stuff like that. But there's just one verse that I couldn't get past this week, and that's, that's what I want to bring as a message today. It just leaps out of the Bible because uh, amidst all some rather common words, just sits verse 12. And I want to end our series with these words from Paul. 1 Corinthians 16, excuse me, verse 13, not verse 12. He says, stay awake, stand firm in your faith, be brave, be strong. Those great words, just timeless words. Don't make any difference where you are, who you are. I mean, they're so important uh, for everyone, no matter what's going on. Stay awake, stand firm in your faith. Be brave, be strong. And of course, in the context of this Corinthian church, everything that was going on there, I mean, bravery and strength means to be able to stand for God in the midst of a generation, in the midst of a, of a culture that's really way off track where there's all kinds of wild things going on. And in the midst of that culture, I think what he's saying was, a, you know, the culture is saying anything's okay as long as, you know, uh, that's in your heart kind of thing. And he's saying, no, it's not. You're going to have to stand strong for Christ in this huge challenge. Now, my translation, you know, this one says be brave. My uh, New American Standard Bible, the one that my old blackie that I carry around for 20 years, old blackie says, act like a man. Do you love that? Guys, listen to this. Why don't we got a sermon for us? Act like a man. I kind of like that, you know. Well, we're not going to stay there long, but this may not or may not may be or may not be a good thing for you know us uh, men, you know. But what a manly verse this is! Uh, it's kind of musky, you know. Act like a man. Uh, finally, there's a message. It's got some testosterone in it, you know. The world's always looking at men and on TV, and they're, you know, they're, they're depicted two ways. If you look at situation comedy, Christian men and situation comedies, okay, they're either crooks or they're just this really weak guy that, you know, just kind of Casper milk toast. That's an illustration for generations gone by. But I like this, you know, act like men, be strong. Don't be such a sissy. You know, suck in your gut, guys can... Push out your biceps, you know. 
grunt and scratch a little bit. <laughs> Act like men, Paul said. Be a man. Have some courage. Ah, yeah. Not your idea of a real man? No, we don't think of Paul that way, do we? We don't think of oh, Paul. He was such a man, manly man, you know. But I, I think Paul wore car hearts. I really do. I think he wore car hearts. You know, I, I wear car hearts on, on Saturdays a lot when I go to work. And I, um, if you ever see me like this, you'll know what I'm feeling like. I've got a car heart vest. Okay. A car heart vest. It's kind of like a preppy redneck. That's what. It's a, it's a vest. And, you know, I put it together with a kind of a grungy shirt and some Carhartt pants and a, you know, a mossy oak hat. And I go to, you know, Lowe's and hang around and look like I'm a contractor or somebody, you know. <laughs> Manly man. <sighs> maybe, maybe Paul wore Carhartt vest, you know. I, I you know I'm being funny here, but you get my point. Paul knew how to take a punch. He, he really could. He, he may not have been wearing Carhartt with bulging muscles and, and, you know, kind of a Duck Dynasty look to him. But, man, I mean, he was all man. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 11, the next, next letter to the Corinthians, 24 to 26. He reviews for them what he's endured. He said, I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews five times. Now, that's how they kick somebody out of a synagogue, is they beat him. <laughs> when you get kicked out of a Jewish synagogue, they beat you with lashes. Five synagogues he got kicked out of. It's, that's a rough life. And then he goes on, I was beaten with rods three times. I was stoned once. The stoning was for blasphemy. It, it, was, it was a capital offense. They were trying to kill the guy. So he's been beat with lashes, beat with rods, stoned. He says, I was shipwrecked three times, and, and I spent a day and a night on the open sea. I've been on many journeys. I faced dangers from rivers, robbers, my people, and Gentiles. I faced dangers in the city, in the desert, on the sea, and from false brothers and sisters. That's his resume. Now, does he wear Carhartts? He's a manly man, I think. Yeah, when he talks and he says, act like men, we ought to be listening. So I think we need to consider the source. He's a tough guy. He says, stay awake, stand firm, firm in your faith, be brave, be strong. I mean, this means something. He's been there and done that. And the fact that he, he lived as long as he did is purely God's protection. I mean, nobody else could do this without God's protection. He had few friends. The Jews didn't like him. He had been a Pharisee. Then he became a Christian. Gentiles didn't like him. Paul was weird. He was opinionated. He was bossy. He was this little Jewish guy who managed to get everyone upset everywhere he went because he just wouldn't be quiet. You know what he said over and over? Jesus, Jesus. He, he acted like Jesus was God or something. That's the way he preached him. Crucified Jesus, Jesus. They go, won't you shut up about Jesus? But that's who he is. And he just kept talking about the cross and the resurrection, the two things they did not want to hear about. They were going, tell us more about the Holy Spirit. Tell us more. And he goes, no, the cross and the resurrection. And, you know, they rejected him unless God had prepared their hearts. If God had prepared their hearts, then they received it. And, and they, you know, they're solid people by his preaching. The world changed. 33 years Paul never gives up. In every city, it's a struggle. Every church had problems. Sometimes they wanted to continue in their old immoral habits. And then in other churches, they said, well, why don't we just be good Jews? Let's, let's do all the old Jewish law that he was teaching against. He, had, he intentionally went to Jerusalem. You read this in the last part of Acts. He says, I want to go to Jerusalem because I know if I go to Jerusalem, they will arrest me. And if I get arrested, I can get sent to Rome. And I'm going to die, and I want to die in Rome, because if I get to die in Rome, I can preach to the Romans. What a life plan. I want to get arrested so I can go to Washington, D.C. And they'll, they're going to kill me there, but I'll get to preach there. Wow. That's who he is. This guy's nutty brave. Call him just nutty brave. 
And when he says stay awake, stand firm in your faith, be brave, be strong, we can be sure he knows what he's talking about. Now, more than likely, we're, you know, we're not shooting quite as high as Paul. We're going, you know, I don't need to be that brave. I don't need to be that strong. We might choose something a little bit less dramatic, a little bit less exciting, but we all want to be brave and courageous. No one wants to be soft and fearful, men or women. Everybody wants to be strong, don't we? I mean, in this command to be strong, be courageous, be, be courageous it, it isn't about really about being tough. Or being manly, we're just joking about that. Gender has nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, many times women, I hate to tell you this, guys, are stronger than us guys because they endure more sometimes. They've been through it. It's about having faith. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. You know this. The opposite of faith is fear. Doubt, you can have some doubts if they lead you to God. If you're, if you're seeking, they'll lead you to the truth. But, but fear, wow. The Bible says 105 times, do not fear or do not be afraid. 105 times. Every important person that was used by God at some time or another heard those words, do not be afraid. We're getting ready for Christmas. What does the angel come when he's, he meets Mary? Do not be afraid. Okay, the angels, uh, when they the, spoke to the shepherds, do not be afraid. Everybody that's used by God hears those words. Do not be afraid. It's the opposite of faith. And over and over in every person, God says, do not be afraid. This is core stuff. If we live in fear, we will never really live. Fear is the problem. Now, I just want to go through a few things here the rest of our time um, that, that comes from Paul. Paul says, stay awake and you know, that's the first core thing I'd think of is to stay awake. If, if we are going to live by faith, then we should not be surprised. We should stay awake. It's, it's so easy just to live every day assuming that everything is going to be all right and nothing is ever going to happen and you're never going to be challenged. But we know that's not real, and yet most of us do that every day. We're not really ready. We just go from day to day. We know it's not real. In fact, we learn from Paul that God actually tests our faith so that we might grow and mature. But to be aware, to stay awake, means that we are engaged and that we are aware of our culture and the changes that take place. Um, later on, Paul would write to the Ephesians in the fifth chapter, the 15th and the 16th verses, these words. He says, so be careful to live your life wisely, not foolishly. Take advantage of every opportunity because these are evil times. It says, be careful. Now, if they were evil in the first century Ephesus, I think we're probably matching that. I, you know, don't you, wouldn't you think that we'd probably matching that? Uh, we don't have the luxury of living uh, what I would call sequestered or, or isolated lives. We're constantly influenced by our culture, and we need to stay awake. We, we, should, we should read things that inform us about the culture. We should read Christian blogs that tell us exactly what's going on. I personally don't like to read that junk. It makes me mad sometimes. I have to fight the anger, but I do it. I read Christian blogs that tell me, analyze the culture and what's going on. I, I don't want to be surprised. Okay, I want to stay awake. I want to be aware of what's going on in this world. It's football season. Um, almost everybody in the room has probably heard of Bear Bryant. He was here for a short time in Kentucky, but probably one of the greatest college football co coaches to ever, ever lived. Um, you know, 38 years he was a football coach. Um, one guy said he wasn't a coach, he was the coach. One of these guys that was on the 73 national championship team, John Croyle, uh, all, of, all uh, American defensive end at Alabama, um, deeply impacted by the man. And he, he wrote of uh, Coach Bryant's uh, pregame speeches. And Bryant would assemble all the players in the locker room and, and pace back and forth, looking into each boy's eyes as he gave this speech. And this is what he said one time. He said, in this game, there are going to be four or five plays that will determine the outcome of this contest. Four or five plays that will swing the momentum towards us or away from us. I don't know which plays these will be. 
You don't know which plays these will be. All you can do is go out there and give all that you have on each and every play. If you're doing that on one of those crucial plays and you catch your opponent giving less, that play will swing things in our direction. And if we rise to the occasion like that on those four or five plays, we're going to leave here today a winner. Think about that. Just four or five plays. I mean, football, according to some people, is a whole lot like life. I don't know, but it works for some people. So maybe this will work for you. But four or five plays in life. I mean, we really do have some decisions that we make that come up that are really important decisions. And usually they're not, we don't prepare for them for, or know that they're coming for months, but they're just in, in our daily routine, you know. Uh, Bear says it really does come down to just a few plays. So it's like, you know, maybe it's been a rough month. And I'm out with some friends. And, you know, I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I need to blow off some steam. But I can drive home. Right? I, I can drive. I've, I've had five or six or seven. I, I can, I'll be all right, right? Just comes down to just a few decisions sometimes. Or maybe it's something like, you know, um, nobody's going to see. Nobody's going to know. I can do this. I can change this. And it's going to benefit me. And nobody's going to know. It's just a little thing. It's just a little lie. Everybody does it. It's just the government. Or it's just the company. You know, it's just those four or five plays that come our way sometimes that make all the difference in a life. But if we're asleep, if we are spiritually not awake, you know, if we're not connected to God by the Holy Spirit, then, then we're not ready. And we, we will do what everyone else is doing. And what everyone else is doing is usually wrong. If we do what the majority wants to do, nine out of ten times we're wrong because the majority is selfish. So, First Peter 5, 8, he says, be clear-headed. <laughs> Keep alert. Your accuser, the devil, is on the prowl like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. On the prowl. Wow, he doesn't say, okay, now I'm, I'm going to test you this week. Or are you ready? You know, because I'm going to test you, and here it comes, and you're going to have something come your way. Uh, have you read the word today? Are you all prayed up? I mean, are, are you okay? Are you awake? Because I'm going to tempt you with something. No, it happens at the most opportune moment for him not for us when we're asleep. Maybe we're tired. Maybe we're depressed. Uh, maybe we've been rejected by someone, just emotionally spent. And that's when he comes. You know, I, th I think of um, the time, the, the story of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness where Satan led him out to the wilderness to be tested for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days in Luke, it says, and the tempter departed for him for a more opportune time opportune time. So God says, stay awake, live alert, be in the spirit. Now the second one is very similar. It's no one suddenly gets brave. We practice bravery. No one suddenly gets strong. Buzz Aldrin, who was the second man to walk in the room, said it this way. He says, bravery comes along as a gradual accumulation of discipline. We don't suddenly get strong. We don't strong suddenly get courageous. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes discipline. So strength in God is a daily exercise, not something we do at retreats and conferences. We'll not stand for something when it's really important unless we've stood for the little things. Some of you might have read, read the bestseller Outliners, Malcolm Gladwell. Um, his 10,000 principle is there in one chapter. Uh, it's become kind of famous now. And he says that it takes 10,000 hours of practice for somebody to become really proficient in, in something. And it's not about natural ability, but it's about practice and practicing right. So his first example were professional violinists. And those who became professional violinists, he found all had at least 10,000 hours of practice. Those that remained amateurs had around 4,000 hours of practice by the time they were age 20. And then he noted that Bill Gates, okay, billionaire, uh, had written code as a child uh, for 10,000 hours, just happened to be 
have access to University of Washington's mainframe and he could sneak out at night when his parents didn't know that he was leaving as a teenager and go into the mainframe and write code, he and his buddy. But you know, Gates just isn't that brilliant. It's just he had a lot of practice. Then he goes through some other guys like Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan. We think, oh, they're, what a supreme talent they are. No, they practiced a lot. They had some talent to begin with, but they practiced a lot. And even the Beatles, you know, the, the Beatles had all kinds of practice before they made it big. No one gets suddenly strong, suddenly brave. We develop our faith muscles through practice. Just knowing the right thing to do, you know, isn't enough. We have to do it. Uh, we say, well, I would never do that. You know, that's not, I, I, I don't need to worry about that. I'd never do that. I'd never give in. Well, if we give in on little things, we'll give in on big things, right? It's the little things that make us strong enough for the big things. Nobody suddenly gets brave. The third thing, and maybe the most important here, is that uh, you can't kill a dead man when it comes to bravery. Courage means that we have nothing to lose. Paul preached the cross. Paul preached the resurrection. It was death with a purpose is what he said it was. Those actually believed that they died with Christ, that their old life was gone. And so they were willing to live in such a way that no one could really take their life because they had already given their life to Christ. When someone is baptized in the water, we say that we are buried with Christ. We go into the tomb with him. Our old life is buried. Okay? Accepting Christ is a time of death to our old nature. These are all symbols of the church, but some of us never get those symbols. They never become real to us. We have to die. We're dying to myself. I'm going to live my life to Christ. Some of us die hundreds of times, over and over. So we find out that I wasn't quite dead. There was part of me that didn't quite make it in the baptistry tank, see? Used to have kids ask me, Don, how long are you going to hold us? How long are we underwater in the baptistry? And I say, until I see bubbles come up. <laughs> Need to die in the tank, so to speak. I always got scared and wondered if I was real or not. Movie 42. Have you seen 42? Wow, that's out on DVD now. What a great movie that is. The story of Jackie Robinson and, and Branch Ritchie and, you know, about the integration in the major leagues and, um, Branch Ritchie just has this great idea. He wants to integrate his team, and there's never been an African-American player on, on anybody. And as they both anticipate, this becomes a major challenge for Robinson and his family because, I mean, people are just ruthlessly cruel to them and call them names to their face and, and their, you know, his wife. And it, it's, it's just nasty. As Jackie struggles against his nature to deal with the abuse, he finds an ally in Ricky who's a Christian. True story. The first meeting, Ricky, or Robinson asked Ricky, he says, you want a player that doesn't have the guts to fight back? Because Ricky's telling him that he can't fight back. And no, no, replies Ricky, I want a player who has the guts not to fight back. People aren't going to like this. They're going to do anything to get you to react. Follow a curse with a curse, and they'll hear only your curse. Follow a blow with a blow, and they'll say the Negro lost his temper, that that the Negro does not belong. Your enemy will be out in force, and you cannot meet him in his own low ground. We win with hitting, running, fielding, only that. We win only if the world is convinced of two things. One, that you're a fine gentleman and a great ball player. Like our Savior, you have to have the guts to turn the other cheek. Can you do it? And Robinson replies, you give me a uniform, you give me a number on my back, and I'll give you the guts. And he did. We have to be willing to die to ourself. That's what Paul was preaching. Uh, one more verse, and we'll close this up. Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says something that really sounds strange. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. That's what he's teaching us be willing to die to ourselves, to be born again in Him. See, courage is something you find when you're living for someone else, when your life is so sold out to a Lord that you no longer really care about yourself, then, then you've got real courage. We die to live. Well, I don't know how this hits you today. Um, that last part hit me pretty strong. Um, 
Like I said, we die to our, ourselves hundreds of times. I want to show you a, a little movie to, to end this up today. Uh, it's a story about a boy named Cody, and uh, it's really inspirational. I, I think that I hope that this hits the mark with you. As deep cries out 